Hello and welcome to Roadmap 2023, our election issues and personalities tracking program. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Thanks for joining us. My guest on the program today says political actors equally or in fact have more of the blame for many of the wrong things that happened during the 2023 general elections. My guest also believes that citizens must improve their interest in those who are governing them with a view to holding them more accountable. Roadmap 2023 talks to the co-convener of the Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room, Mr. James Ugochuku. Mr. James Ugochuku, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you, viewers. Let's, uh, let's begin with uh, what we know at this time about this uh, Adamawa situation. Um, the governorship election uh, was inconclusive when it was conducted alongside the others uh, on March uh, the 18th. And then, you know, the supplementary election was conducted on the weekend of April the 15th. And then this drama now started unfolding, uh, as we know. What do you make of the whole situation? I think we are having a, a scenario in the country where other countries will be watching the kind of dramas and stunts we pull at each electoral uh, exercise. Uh, what happened uh, is a very big surprise and uh, it's something that people are still at shock for the reason why uh, the whole thing went the way it is. And that goes to show you the desperation of the political class, irrespective of uh, which party divide they are in. Because a situation where people now don't respect their rule book, it becomes very worrisome. And to cap with the fact that uh, the wreck that announced that result is a lawyer. So it's not a question of him not knowing the content of the electoral act with respect to uh, the announcement of results as stipulated in section 66 of the electoral act. So uh, what this is showing is that uh, the political class are taking uh, electoral impunity to the highest level. And the reason is simple. They know that they can do anything and get out of it. So this is not the kind of uh, electoral system we're expecting. After getting a new electoral that put us into this, uh, uh, that we are using for this particular election, because we seriously push for electoral reform, you know, and the National Assembly, they did a very good job, you know, coming up with this new electoral act. Some of the provision they put there is even something that somebody can uh, refer to them shooting themselves in the foot or doing things to, you know, please Nigerians and all that. But the same politicians are now the ones that are bending the rules with, in connivance with some rogue element in uh, INEC. So for me and uh, for other uh, election watchers, this is a serious, uh, ridiculous uh, scenario that uh, shouldn't have been. And of course, the, old, the way the whole thing played out, you know, the uh, 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 result was announced, the coalition is still going on, uh, the electoral management body, INEC, too, were uh, expressing shock. So what this shows you is uh, a system that is not uh, in sync with its uh, operation. Because the question you ask yourself is, under whose authority did the REC announce that result? What consultation did it make? What uh, constitutional backing or electoral law or any guideline or any other extant law did he use, you know, to carry out that uh, uh, action? And of course, if you look at what happened again after that, you see uh, the people resorting to self-help and uh, mob action, you know, beating him up and filming him and all that. I mean, this is not how elections should be in a modern democracy. That is true, but uh, as you mentioned, you said the resident electoral commissioner in Adawa State is a lawyer, and um, there was a handwritten statement that he was going to read uh, uh, when he was to make that declaration, uh, which, of course, come, uh, came out subsequently to indicate that uh, he was also citing provisions of the law where he said, look, that is not the job of anyone outside uh, uh, the returning officer and the resident electoral commissioner of the state to announce results. Of course, that begs the issue of the fact that INEX national headquarters had sent two national commissioners to Adama State to superintend over the process because one of the major political parties in the contest 
had expressed a lack of confidence in this same resident electoral commissioner, you know, in between uh, the conduct of the main election that took place on the 18th of March and this supplementary one on the 15th of April. So INEC headquarters, in a bid to ensure that there was absolute transparency, so they said, you know, put him on the sidelines during this process. But he reinserted himself into, you know, into the process. So again, does it, uh, doesn't this speak to perhaps loopholes that people are exploiting uh, in the legal process itself? Well, uh, if you ask me, the Electoral Act is very clear in terms of uh, who to handle the, you know, the final result and the declarational result of every election. So the question we keep asking ourselves is this. If INEC uh, sent the, I mean, the REC or appoint somebody as a returning officer, then INEC should have done his own uh, uh, homework very well before you can send somebody as REC. And this is what we keep complaining in the civil society when it comes to recruitment of uh, uh, resident electoral commissioners. You know, we need to put somebody that is completely non-partisan, somebody that doesn't have any integrity questions or somebody that doesn't have any past political uh, alliance or allegiance to any particular people. So for them to be coming at the last minute to be doing that shows that they didn't do their homework very well. And of course, uh, I think the REC found that, okay, his uh, state is being threatened. And of course, he should look for loopholes to do that, which is complete dereliction of duty in line with Section 120 of the uh, Electoral Act. He's duty bound to respect the Electoral Act and the annex guidelines of uh, the people that sent him to work. And from the other part, of, uh, from the other angle, the uh, annex headquarters are supposed to be in, in, you know, in complete communication with the REC that this is exactly what we are going to do. So you don't just absorb people's power halfway. If they don't want him to be there, just like the directive they issued to him yesterday, it's okay, uh, Mr. REC, stand down. We are sending electoral uh, national commissioner to superintend this uh, particular exercise. And of course, even with the presence of the national commissioners, what we still expect is that the returning officer will be the ultimate person that will do the declaration of results. So if you look at the whole gamut of the uh, operation, you see that there is fault from both sides. The other man is trying, there is a case of who will assume the other person. And of course, uh, this is where the whole thing has uh, led us. Mr. In respective of the uh, angle the wreck is coming from, the whole thing is still clear that he violated the law by announcing the result because it's not his duty to do it according to the law we have now. Maybe until we do some kind of amendment subsequently. Now what is coming out of INEC at the moment is that uh, the, the, the national commissioners met uh, and uh, what has come out of it is that they are recommending to the Inspector General of Police to investigate the REC uh, and, uh, and uh, recommend him for possible prosecution. In the meantime, they have also resolved that they are going to write to the, what they described as the appointing authority of the REC, which, uh, you know, many people have said that means Mr. President, uh, you know, to uh, look, determine uh, the appointment of uh, this REC uh, on the basis of uh, misconduct. Uh, um, uh, you know, so again, does this not speak to what you referred to earlier on some level of tardiness in the vetting process of officials? I remember when some resident electoral commissioners were appointed uh, uh, a while back and they were subject to scrutiny at the level of the National Assembly. Uh, Non-governmental organizations in the process like yours and others had raised points about you know, the background of some of these people who have been appointed as being previous uh, politicians and uh, people with political interests and all of that. Uh, but at that time, the law was quoted as having said that, you know, there's nowhere where it prevents someone uh, from uh, uh, occupying the position of a resident electoral commissioner simply because he has uh, political interests or he has political leanings in one uh, uh, party or the other. Now, in view of what we have now witnessed uh, in the case of Adamawa, regardless of how it eventually turns out, um, is it not time for us to perhaps review that law, if indeed that is the situation with the law as it relates to these officials? 
I think the law is very clear when it comes to the recruitment of these regs. Uh, we just have a political class that uh, abuse power once they grab the power, and that is the problem we have with uh, our uh, political, I mean, election system. I have a situation whereby when people get to power, it's an absolute uh, winner takes it all. They don't give regards to the constitution, they don't give regards to the electoral act, they don't give regards to the extant law. And these are the law that they made themselves, so they see themselves. Uh, you know, being at liberty to do whatever they like. And this is why it's very important for us to be looking back to uh, waste reports, because uh, the provision of waste reports uh, takes the power to pick all this, uh, from the INEC chairman to the resident electoral commissioner to different uh, other important things away from the president. Because if the president is the sole person that appoints these people, you know, he's bound to abuse the power. Maybe he will not even want to do it uh, willingly, but his party members and uh, other people can advise him to do the wrong thing. Because a situation whereby uh, the resident electoral commissioner are being nominated by politicians and all those things, let's even take away the fact that they've not have any political allegiance and all that. For the fact that they are being recommended by politicians or people in the appointed or elective office, then you see that they are bound to, you know, dance to the tunes of that, those persons, you know. Uh, the, they say that the, he who pays the papa pays the tune. So if we can go back to a, a waste report, which recommend that these offices should be handled by National Judicial Council, it will make a lot of sense because one person cannot appoint one person and you expect the person to be loyal to every other person apart from the person that uh, appointed the person. So it's, it's something that we should be looking at in the next electoral reform that will be coming out in the 10th Assembly. We can't continue this way. It's not only the Adamawa person. Okay, this his own is now by volume and uh, visibility. What of other uh, electoral, um, resident electoral commission? What of the things they did at the background that we cannot even see? something beyond the visible. These are the things we are looking at. Because by the time you start uh, uh, allowing the president or people in political offices to be picking the umpire, no matter what the umpire do, there will be room for suspicion, except the, the opposition win the election. That's when they will now say, okay, it's free and fair. But so long as the opposition loses, no matter how free and fair the process is, they will always say that there is a some kind of uh, uh, foul play because that can, uh, the umpire is the candidate of the person they are contesting with. So it's something we should look at and swallow the bitter pill and do the right thing as Nigeria. Earlier on, you did talk about Electoral Act 2022, um, which uh, the president signed into law ahead of this electoral process. And just like you said, a number of people said, look, this electoral law was, you know, a massive improvement on uh, what we had before in many respects. But come the 2023 elections, there were still so many complaints from so many quarters. Adamawa is just the latest. During the main elections, the presidential and governorship elections, there were so many complaints about IREV, about Beavers, about the process, uh, violence, security, uh, coalition, and all of that. Um, so, with the benefit of hindsight, do you think that, and now we are talking about the 10th Assembly and further electoral reform, um, and so those who may be listening to you will be asking the question, uh, when are we going to stop this reform process? Uh, it doesn't look as if the problem is with the process, it is with the actors. Uh, so, are we going to change the actors? Well, the thing is, uh, in two ways, for instance, now, uh, we are looking at... Uh, laws that have been made by the political class, the legislature, they came up with the law, you know, the executive, they are sent to it. And when it comes to running with the law, the same people will now start violating the same law they made. So in that aspect now, we're not looking at uh, uh, carrying out any other fresh uh, electoral reform on that. Of course, the technology that they, you know, uh, allowed in this process is to reduce all the things that we saw playing back in uh, 
the 2023 election. Of course, we use those technology in the off-cycle election in uh, Kiti, in Ondo, in uh, those states and all those places. And we had very, very minimal incidences of uh, violence and all that. So the problem is not with the technology. The problem is the application of the technology. So that you use your phone to scan people doesn't make the phone a bad thing. It's the way you are using it. So those technology, if the umpire and other stakeholders should respect this particular technology, things will move on smoothly. But we are kind of people that uh, we do the wrong thing and we start crying why things are not going uh, well. For instance, now, the, we saw where political uh, or politicians sponsors talks to go and uh, snatch the, the beaver's machine. How does that, uh, what does that tell you? Or a situation whereby it gets to the point of uh, transmitting results to RF portal and the beaver's machine is not working. For your information, the Beavers machine on the RF, RF uh, web portal were hosted on one of the most secure and one of the most sophisticated web server in the world, the Amazon web server, AWS. Now, with the kind of budget that was uh, given to support INEC in this election, that issue of uh, on inability to upload the reports, I mean the result to RF portal should have not even come uh, into place. So are we looking at uh, competence in the, in, the, in the side of the ICT team of INEC or some kind of support touch from there? Because definitely that problem cannot come from Amazon because they have about 99.9% off time in, ter in, in terms of uh, performance. Then coming to the other issue that need amendment, and I'll still keep on hammering in the, on, the, in the, on the issue of uh, appointment of the and the President Electoral Commissioner. If we leave that particular part of the law, we'll keep on having these particular issues. Because if we appoint somebody as a, a INEC rec or INEC chairman and all that, the person is still under authority whether you like it or not. That's why uh, Justice Uwe's report, in their wisdom, and we are looking at people, a multidisciplinary committee of 23 men from the civil society, from uh, the religious body, from the academia, from uh, the judiciary, executive, everybody made input into this report. And they came up with this particular recommendation. And of course, the president that made that happen, President Umar uh, Musayar Adwa, immediately after a swearing in, he admitted that the process that brought him to power is greatly flawed, and he set up that committee. So they took every bit, all that beautiful uh, recommendation from the committee report, but that particular one that the president should uh, nominate uh, an chairman, they refused that one. So, you know, we need to go back to that report and, as I said earlier, swallow that bitter pill and, you know, ensure that this process is taken away from the president. Let it be that if we need our next chairman, we will ask people to submit their application. They submit their application. The National Judicial Council should look at the application, uh, you know, uh, reduce the candidate to three or so, and of course, uh, take it to uh, uh, National Council of State, uh, you know, to, to pick one of them and all that. These are the kind of things we are looking at, not the president just picking somebody out of recommendation from uh, party members. And at the end of the day, we, we start crying that uh, there is a, a manipulation of the election or, or not no manipulation. So we should take away that burden from uh, whoever becomes the next and next chairman. Let it be open for everybody to, you know, participate and we choose and next chairman. The same thing goes for REC. Like, for instance, when they were appointing the last uh, REC now, we raised dust about uh, four or five of them, you know, that have a relationship or allegiance to, with uh, state government. Uh, some of them have even contested the uh, uh, governorship position and all that. Some of them are card carrying members. You know, we cried out to a, a high heaven, but they still went ahead to allow these people to become a wreck at the end of the day. So these are the things we should not be dancing to and fro from. We know the right thing to do, and of course we need to tell ourselves the truth that this is the t time to do the right thing. Because the thing is, if we keep on messing our electoral process like this, the whole world is watching and we will get to a point that we will become a laughing stock in the Committee of Nations. And if we are doing an election, nobody will come because they will be afraid of their, their life. They will be even concerned that what is going to change in this uh, 
uh, people's election that is what's even coming to observe and all that. And we'll just be isolated in the scheme of things. Nigeria is, 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 by virtue of its position as big brother of Africa, should be showing good example to other Africans. As we speak now, Kenya is being rated as a democracy alongside Ghana, alongside uh, Botswana and other countries. But it comes to Nigeria now, Nigeria has not been rated as a democracy yet. We've been rated as hybrid. So we are neither democracy or authoritarian. And there's something that we should be ashamed of and, of course, work towards uh, you know, shifting base to the right place. But we have had uh, several election cycles, uh, Mr. Gochuku. Uh, you are co-convener of the Nigerian Civil uh, uh, Society uh, uh, Situation Room, so you are in a good position to look at this uh, objectively and, uh, and assess. We have had several election cycles. Some have pointed out that 1999, 2003, 2007, 2011, 15, 2019, and now 2023, that our process has improved with each election cycle. There are others who say that's not correct, that the, election, that this, the, 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 the process has not improved. It's just that the problems have changed uh, and that therefore that's what gives the impression that things have, have improved. What do you make of it as someone who has been in the process uh, for a long time? H are we going down the road towards democracy uh, in your view or are we stagnating, especially in view of the last comment you made? which is that we are not yet described as democracy, even though we have been practicing this for uh, about uh, 24 years now. Well, it depends on the angle you are looking at it, but there are different phases or uh, stages of the electoral process. In terms of uh, administration now, uh, 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 in terms of data capture and all that, at least we have better uh, voter register than before. I remember prior to now, one person can have up to uh, how many uh, voters card. People can vote as many times as possible. People can vote from one polling unit and go to another polling unit and vote and all that. We don't have a comprehensive uh, voter register. But over time now, from the time uh, Professor Jega introduced the direct data capture machine to the time we brought the uh, smart card reader to Beavers, now I think if you look at it from that angle, We've made a lot of progress. It's not like before. So election is seamless now. But now this is where the problem is. Having achieved all that, then the political class will now bring a, 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 a spanner in the wheel of progress by ensuring that the system is manipulated in such a way that on election day, where the whole road is clear, where there's no traffic obstruction of any sort or any means, election material cannot move from I neck uh, office to the closest polling unit by that, uh, by that area. Whether it's the political class or the I neck in ineptitude, we can't say for sure. But you see that this has nothing to do with uh, the process, but deliberate sabotage of uh, people in the process. And they do this because nobody's punishing them. Now, if you look at uh, the mentality of the citizen, now that one has not changed because uh, citizens align with uh, political uh, parties or candidates uh, uh, based on religious or ethnic uh, sentiment. You know, it's a few cases that you see citizens, they will be, you know, shaking hand across the, the border. And all things just uh, boil down to one fact. When we, when we grab power, we have control of all the resources. So let us uh, uh, align ourselves as a phalanges to this particular political party or political uh, candidate. So until we remove that mentality and start thinking Nigeria, we keep on having or being described as a, a hybrid democracy. We should be looking at a situation whereby as candidates are emerging, as political parties are emerging, we'll be asking them, what is your political ideology? What plans do you have for the country? What plans do you have for the citizen? What is going to be your foreign policy? What is going to be economic policy and all those things? So, so that by the time we are convinced, irrespective of where you come from, you can now align with uh, that particular political party based on issue, based on agenda and based on a clear court uh, manifesto. Not that you come uh, during election, you come and uh, bamboozle people, promise what you think you cannot, uh, uh, you are going to give them at the end of the day, you know fully well that you are not going to uh, do all this. Then when it comes to the 
election uh, process proper now. Just as I mentioned before, people now, after aligning with uh, political parties or candidates, the next thing they do is that they do everything at all costs to grab that power. For instance, all this violence we are seeing, and all that can classify them to solicited and unsolicited uh, violence. Most of these violence, I can assure you, are not ordered by the uh, political party candidate. There's a group of people that are trying to, you know, impress the the candidates and uh, of course ensure that the person grabs power so that at the end of the day they can have a bargaining tool that okay will help you to get to power and all that so you see all manner of uh, alignments and the uh, mobilization of uh, uh, thugs and uh, other people that to cause violence in the election so this one now has nothing to do with uh, whether uh, the system is not improving or not but the mentality of us as nigerians and the reason is so simple uh, Power in Nigeria is something that when you get into it, you grab all the resources and everything. And of course, we have citizens that uh, don't hold government accountable or they lack the capacity to ask questions and all that. And of course, the government do anything they like. At the most, the citizens will complain and they will keep quiet and go to the next level. So until we start looking at all these things, and start uh, taking election as a complete cycle where citizens will remain vigilant from the pre-election era to the election era to the post-election era. I don't think we can be described as democracy in the very near future. I think that, uh, as some have said, that uh, the political parties play a critical role in this process. What, what you just said now, they are the main drivers of, of, the, uh, of the process, the democratic process, if you like. So whether it is in elections, it is in party ideology, it is in mobilizing voters, it is in keeping government on its toes, political parties are very important. But it appears that from 1999, even pre-1999, we got it wrong uh, in the process of setting up the political parties. Uh, the various things you mentioned, you know, how the parties came to be, their ideological basis, so that people can feel free to join parties on on ideological basis, not on ethnic or religious basis. Uh, all that we seem to have gotten wrong, even pre-1999, and that even though the number of political parties has consequently increased, increased and increased up until, I think, uh, 2019, where we have something like uh, 90 or so political parties, in reality, I mean, it, it, nothing really had changed. All these 90 parties, were either one-man parties or they were parties based on ethnic or religious basis. Uh, and that that foundation which we got wrong at uh, pre-1999 is still with us today. If that is so, how do we go about changing it? Because if we don't change it, as you said, if we don't change it, then we are still going to have more of this. There are more elections coming. Kogi, Imo, and uh, Bayelsa are due in November. So it's not as if we finish with this and we go and sleep. There are still more coming, and we are likely to witness some of the problems that we witnessed in this 2023 uh, general election. You know, I, I earlier uh, said something about swallowing the bitter pill. It's a bitter pill we need to swallow, you know. For instance, now, uh, the president just uh, made, the, it's just assented to some of the some provisions in the constitution now, which has removed a lot of things from the uh, executive list to, you know, concurrent list. So we should be looking at the centralizing power from the center. Because this centrality mentality is what is affecting us uh, as a country. If we should remove power from the center, there will be zero or, very, or near zero uh, jostling for power the way it is now. If we can go back to the regional government that we practiced before, it will pay us a lot better than what we are doing, so that the government will be closer to the people, so that political representative will be closer to the people, so that people will now feel that they have you know, a say in the governance of their country. Because what we have here now, like I said before, is a winner takes all. Once somebody wins election, the person will now be checking, okay, which uh, region voted for me, which region did not vote for me, uh, how do I do appointment? So you see that by the time they get to power, they carry out appointment lopsidedly, and at the end of the day, you see that uh, a lot of people will be feeling marginalized. So, so long as certain people will feel marginalized, they will definitely 
continue to do what we are doing. You know, it's trying to be desperate to grab power at all costs because they know that's the only way they will stay relevant. So until we make the political system in such a way that everybody is carried along, where everybody has a sense of belonging, we keep on having this uh, particular issue. And the only solution to that, for my own end, is one, that we go back to the regional government or we have a constitutional amendment that we give us a, in a scenario where we have a rotational uh, presidency. We say, okay, this president is coming to the south. Let us know that any person from the north should not be contesting for that uh, particular election year. If he's going to the north, everybody in the north, I mean, everybody in the south should not even dream of uh, contesting for that time. But we refuse to fix that in our constitution, and that's where we're having the problem we're having now. So we now have a question of uh, uh, a Muslim has finished, another Muslim is taking, uh, 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 is going to take power, uh, uh, a northerner has finished, another northerner wants to take power. So if we have this thing put in place that, okay, if a Christian is done, a Muslim should be the next one. If a, if a northerner is done, another northerner, I mean, a southerner should take over, then that way is not a hard, uh, rocket science to do is for us to put it as law so that at the end of the day all these things will be rotating God, government is a continuum and i keep telling people uh nigeria has not matured to the point that uh, people will remove ethno religious sentiments it's not something we should be uh, sugarcoating it's very very deep and these are the this, this scene i suggested is the only thing that can tame that when everybody know that my own turn, turn is coming the person will cool down and allow the other person to finish because uh, I keep telling people that grabbing power has never helped any region or any, any religion or any tribe. But if you look at uh, our past president and all that, if you go to their hometowns and everything, how has them being president changed the fortune of their, their, their state? Last time I checked, the biggest city in Nigeria still remains uh, Kano, uh, Abuja, Portacot, and Lagos. How many presidents have come from these places? So other states that we have present, like uh, Niger State, like uh, Ogun State, like um, Katsina State, and all those things, like uh, Plateau State, how has their person being president changed their fortune? Nothing has changed. Most of these states, they live in serious poverty and all that. So should we have a situation whereby, first of all, we tame our ethno-religious sentiment through rotational presidency. Let it go to north now, then the next time south. When the whole thing is coming, then, over time, we can now weigh as okay which uh, particular region is uh, taking the dividend of democracy to its own region or to Nigeria as large. So, I think this is what I sh we should be looking at. So, position amendment very, very important because if we don't do this, we will still see political politicians coming out during election to you know uh, clash people uh, against themselves on the basis of religion or uh, ethnicity, because it's only during election that you see politicians trying to ad identify with different religion and different uh, ethnic group. But the main game they have is you still go back and tell the ethnic uh, nationality that you should not vote for this uh, particular candidate because it's from the other ethnic group or it's from the other religion. We saw that play out prominently in, 20, in this 2023 election in complete disregard of uh, Section 92 of the Electoral Act. So, you know, if we try this as an experiment, I think uh, it's something we should, we can sit back with time and, uh, you know, count the cost. The, during the election process, uh, President Buhari signed some constitutional amendments, and I make reference to them now because you talked about constitutional amendments. Uh, some of them were pretty profound. There's uh, the one that grants legislative and judicial autonomy, particularly at uh, the level of the states. There's the one that removed uh, things like electricity supply, the railway system, and prisons uh, from the exclusive list and moved them onto the concurrent list, uh, uh, among others. I mean, are these in line with what you have just described as part of the things that will make a uh, power grab at the center less attractive uh, so that people will then concentrate on other levels of power where the impact could possibly be more? Well, partly it, it, it's uh, a, a, a roadmap to that direction. But uh, the only thing that will make it to work now 
is uh, what I've earlier mentioned. You have uh, bad followership as well. After this election, now citizens will go back to their various uh, clusters and be doing their things without taking uh, accountability seriously. For instance, now that they've given electricity, they've put it in a concurrent list now. What we'll be expecting uh, citizens from different uh, states now, region is now, is to come up with uh, legislative and uh, executive agenda for the incoming uh, government. This, uh, this thing we have been complaining that is a problem of the federal government has been given to you. So this is uh, our charter of demand. We expect that before uh, your fourth year in office, you have started the rail line from uh, this rural area to the other. I've already started this uh, electricity power project and all that. Because take it or leave it, we have a uh, huge source of revenue, whether internally generated or external ones at the state level. And of course, uh, with this provision now, if all this revenue are well managed, development will start uh, at different places. Because if your state is developed and my state is developed, why should anybody be worried about uh, coming to the center to do anything? So I think it's a right uh, step in the right direction for that particular provision of the constitution to be passed. Part of the problem we are facing in the country today now is electricity. You put electricity in place, a lot of things is going to happen. Industrial revolution will kickstart again. You know, uh, foreigners will be interested in coming to, uh, 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 you know, put their business in Nigeria. Foreign direct investment will increase. And of course, uh, this crime we are uh, complaining will reduce because you to be gainfully em employed. Look at what our youth are doing in the entertainment industry, in the music industry, and the other this because even with the power situation we are having, so just imagine the level it will rise when there is a steady power. Not to talk of uh, uh, the agro-allied industry that need to run on electricity for agri-processing and all those things. So it's a right step in the right direction, provided that the citizen know the provision of this uh, uh, the provision of this constitution and uh, this uh, ascent, ascent that the, the president has made and of course table their chart of demand from this political class because what the political class at the region has been doing is to shift the attention of the people to the center you know Blaming everything on the center, just the way they are blaming Buhari now. Buhari did not do this, Buhari did not do that, and all that. But each and every uh, state, they get allocation from the federal government on a monthly basis. And most uh, uh, federal parliament members, they receive constituency allowance and all that. We want to carry out audit of how this money is being spent now. I think that is a complete, uh, another kind of one that nobody will want to open. So the citizens need to wake up. And of course, start holding their regional uh, representative responsible. There's nothing wrong uh, with the old five, C, uh, five uh, Southeast governor now coming up to say, okay, now that they've signed this uh, railway uh, bill, move railway from executive to concurrent list, let us have a railway network connecting Abakaleki to Abia, to Imo, to Anambra back to Osuka in Enugu state and all that. And when you open this, you see that there will be serious boom in economic activities. People can move from rural area, go to the urban area and go back at the same, t uh, the same day. There will be the congestion of urban area and crime will reduce. So will the people of Southeast or other region make all this demand from the, uh, their regional representative, their governors and all that, is left for them to start putting on their thinking cap because the blank check has been given to them. Same thing with power. If these two things are in place, I think uh, uh, nobody will be complaining of uh, the country being underdeveloped. So for me, it's a very big plus to Buhari administration to sign that into uh, uh, law. It's a big, pill, a big bitter pill that he took in doing that. And of course, it's left for different regions now to kickstart their development agenda and plans. One other thing that has come out, uh, not just from this election, has always been a talking point, is that um, one expects, there are those who say that they expect, that all litigation that has to do with elections should be concluded decisively before handovers take place, before new governments are inaugurated. Even though in Nigeria's current system, the uh, timing has been shortened. There are now constitutionally mandated dates 
by which cases must be concluded. But those dates, uh, in many instances, exceed the time uh, before the new administrations uh, are to be inaugurated. And there are those who say that, look, this is antithetical to democracy. Uh, there are those who are actually arguing uh, that, you know, uh, it amounts to uh, some form of problem with democracy that someone takes office over whom there is contention on his or her victory. Uh, but the person has taken office. So if you remember, in 2007, 2010, there were several governors, particularly in the Southwest, uh, whose uh, uh, mandates, if you like, were subject of litigation. But in some instances, they had spent three years, three and a half years, before the courts determined that they were not the winners of the election uh, and that they should vacate the office and so on. Many people felt that was unjust. Um, so what do you make of this issue about whether or not the litigation should have been concluded before people take office? Are we making a mountain out of a molehill because eventually uh, the process will come to some kind of conclusion? Well, look, using a layman uh, example now, you, ha uh, you and I are contesting a, a particular piece, piece of uh, fertile land, and I'm now allowed to stay in that land and be farming and selling and be making the money to go to court with you. It doesn't make sense. So I align myself with the school of thought that said that uh, this particular uh, 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 litigation should be done away with. In fact, that was another beautiful recommendation of waste reports. I keep on referring to waste reports, but this is a report that was made by think tanks, elder statesmen, people that have seen life and everything, people that have traveled. You know, it's a multi-stakeholder interdisciplinary committee that uh, I've never seen the tab being set up uh, in Nigeria. And they make this particular recommendation that judgment of the tribunal should be dispensed with four months even before the election, so that uh, if there's uh, even if there's any need for a run, they can quickly do it and uh, insert the new person. Because the issue we have now, by December, uh, what do you call it? By November, now we're going to conduct three uh, states governorship election. All this as a result of what you have just explained. Somebody who spent several. Uh, months or years in office and at the end of the day they remove the person and bring another person. It's a waste of our taxpayers' money. But because in Nigeria we don't really take audit of that. We get money from crude oil so we don't count their money we waste in all these things. It's unnecessary. And uh, if this trend continues, after this 2023 election now we are still going to have more of cycle election. Imo has just joined now. Uh, which one are we going to obtain again? So at the end of the day, if care is not taken, maybe in the year 2060-something, we'll be having a staggered election every year or every month in different states. So it looks funny, but this is the where we are headed. So that waste report and that particular provision needs to be you know, pushed forward as another set of electoral reform. Because, for instance, now, if you now put me in power from day one, because I know that uh, my victory is under dispute. I won't be interested in any developmental project. I'll just be looking for where I can amass as much uh, uh, fund as possible, still as much as, as I can do all sort of fraudulent things because I'm not sure I'm going to be there. And of course, use state resources to even uh, you know, prosecute the, the case in the tribunal or in the court, whereas my opponent will not be using the remaining money from his campaign and the electoral process to be you know, doing the same thing. Then, I'll, because I have control over the state's apparatus, the, the judiciary or the legislature, as the case may be, I can now be pulling string and be delaying the process and be wearing my opponent out to the point that person may end up uh, even giving up uh, uh, hope of uh, reclaiming his or her mandate and all that. So we should go back and ensure that this is done with, you know, tribunal or the petition will be done before we now swear in. If the person comes in, comes out clear that, yes, I have been declared winner uh, by the Supreme Court or the appeal court, as the case may be, let the person be sworn in. But putting the person in power while there are still uh, contention, I think I don't align with that uh, school of thought. That's why we are having all the problem we are having in uh, uh, this country. So, and uh, the political class have tweaked this to mean that just grab the power first and get in there. Then we'll look at the aftermath. Let the person go to court. By the time the person go to court, we are the one. We are the court. We have the whole place. So let me see how you are going to come and retrieve this power from me. Because if you look at it, uh, apart from the governorship election 
and uh, some other places. How many uh, of these things has been on, upturned, uh, as the case may be? So we should uh, sit up, you know, and take the bitter pill and do the right thing we, we need to do. That recommendation of the uh, uh, Justice who waste reports, which says that election petition and uh, all the judgment should be done with the first wedding, it should be looked into seriously before we can, you know, have a very headway and stop wasting our time and resources on the, uh, what do you call it now, off-cycle elections, off -season elections, as the case may be. Yes. Now, I, I, I can't let you go, even as we wind down this uh, discussion, without asking you to, you know, now look ahead. You, re you referred to it a little bit earlier when you talked about, you know, that in November, and I also referred to it, in November, there are going to be more elections. Governorship elections are due in three states. Uh, between now and then, and even shortly after that, several other elections are due at other levels of government. Um, what should INEC, because whether we like it or not, whether there are issues with what INEC has done in 2023 general elections or not, INEC is still going to be the one to conduct the elections in November and other such elections. Um, what should they be looking at to do differently between now and November uh, so that, again, there's obvious improvement in some of the things that people have talked about, you know, that went wrong with the 2023 general election, which took place in February, March, and April. I think uh, what I next need to do for me are two critical things. One is to do a comprehensive audit of this 2023 election. Because from the presidential election to the governorship to the supplementary election, it looks as if the thing is going from uh, bad to worse, worst. So they need to do serious uh, audit trail of what went wrong, comprehensive one, and come up with uh, you know, a report that will expose everything that happened. That is on one part. Then on the second part, they should now go into serious reorientation of the mindset of the uh, people working in the, con uh, in the commission. What I mean by this is that we've seen that uh, there seems to be lack of commitment in terms of uh, how they go about their operation. Because how can we continue to have uh, logistic challenges when it comes to uh, on election day? It shows that there is no improvement or people are not learning anything. Then the third thing they need to do is to you know, pick some of uh, these people that uh, should I mean, sabotage the effort of the, the commission during the process and punish them for the election of duty. Because some of these people, they do this thing because nothing happened to them at the end of the day. They do it and get away with it. So from that audit, they will carry out, they'll be able to find out exactly who and who sabotage our effort. And they will punish them according to Section 120 of the Electoral Act. So these are the things that I think they need to do. And they still have enough time to... Uh, carry out uh, all this exercise. There is no reason for them to perform, uh, 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 in fact, perform poorly again in this election that is going to happen on uh, on November, because it's three elections that is going to happen. So I expect them to start putting their house in order and start, uh, of course, uh, preparing their people ahead of uh, time, and of course, start seeing new initiative they can bring in this process because it's apparent that some of the initiatives have not worked so they have to find out what made it not to work then the one that worked well what made it to work then they improve on all that then ahead of that again they should still work on the way they allow politicians to nominate candidates and all that because it's part of the problem at the end of the day you pick uh, you allow candidates to skate through your screening process and they have questionable credentials. Uh, some didn't go to, I mean, some didn't do their NYC, some uh, brought forged result and all that. We have enough forensic experts in this country that I can outsource this process to them. When people submit their listing, go and verify if these people truly are genuinely who they are. So that, not, so that at the end of the day, will not be having a case of. Uh, you know, people going to court on the basis of some uh, a, a candidate that falsifies record and all those things. And of course, the next thing they should do is to ensure that they work with the security operators and all that to fought, uh, I mean, f 
fish out politicians that have made uh, that, that uh, disrupted this particular process because if INEC deployed everything and the uh, politicians came with their talks to disrupt the process, you cannot blame INEC uh, in that uh, regards. So they have the records and all that. They saw everything that happened. They should be able to work with the security to ensure that these people are well uh, dealt with. So I think uh, if INEC carry out all these processes, they should have a better uh, outing in November 2023. And they don't have time as it is now. Because after this uh, timeouts and the inauguration of new government, which you expect the new government to kick the ground running because we lost a lot of ground already. Uh, first quarter of the year is gone. We are in the second quarter. We are still talking about uh, election. So I, I was, I'm hoping that uh, the new government have already had their cabinet in place. We don't want a situation like that of uh, President Buhari that it took him several months to get his minister. We're expecting that the new government already have their list of uh, who is going to be in what position so that immediately May 29, as they're announcing it, after they are leaving uh, Eagle Square, we have, uh, we start seeing the appointments being made here and there. And of course, we we'll see that the government will start running the following day. <laughs> there will be many Nigerians who will join you in that expectation. Uh, Co-convener, Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room, uh, James Ugochiku, thank you for your time. Uh, today on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That's our program today. We would, of course, like to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen or watch this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast and YouTube pages. Please visit our website, channelstv.com, to get started. I am Ladi Akiridulu Ali. Goodbye. <music>